Dear Father in heaven, thank you for being so kind to us. Uh, thank you for incredible mercy and incredible justice. Thank you for your amazing character that blends those in a way we can't understand. Uh, as we study together this morning, we pray for the Holy Spirit to give us discernment, to give us understanding so that as we go to different places on the stage of Earth's history that we will stand and we will stand in defense of what is true and right. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to share just a little story. It has nothing to do with the sermon, but I, I think it was very, it was really educative for me uh, this week. I had a phone call from an individual uh, in the Northeast, and she runs a global prayer line for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And... Um, she said, we really want you to come on our program. And I thought, well, you, you must know better than I do. So uh, she said, uh, when can you come on? And I said, well, give me a couple of dates. Well, we agreed for me to come on last night. And um, so everything was good. I had a pretty good idea. I was looking at a couple of different subjects. Well, yesterday morning as I was filling orders in the fellowship hall, I had a, a phone call from the assistant coordinator of that global prayer line. And uh, she started off, she said, um, can we please have prayer? So she prayed. And when she got done, she said, now, uh, Pastor Hughes, um, I'm in charge of the speakers that come on this global prayer line. Um, and she said, I have a few questions for you. I said, fire away. She said, um, are you a part of the organized Seventh-day Adventist Church? And I said, absolutely not. Uh, she said, do you still have a church in Florida that is separate from the Florida conference? I said, I absolutely do. She said, are you a part of the free SDA movement, uh, which is located in northern Georgia? I said, no, I am not. But then I said, however, I know the man, Pastor Patrick Herbert, who is in charge of that uh, free SDA movement. And I said, while I'm not a part of it, I think that Pastor Herbert is a fine, dedicated Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Um, she then said, she said, do you send your tithe and do you encourage the people that support you to send their tithe to the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. And I said, ma'am, I haven't supported the apostasy in the denomination for the last 25 years, and I most surely never encourage anyone to support that apostasy. She then said, um, and then I, then I said, ma'am, if you go back, I said, I have a five-part series on YouTube uh, concerning the paying of tithe and offerings. And I said, Ellen White herself did not support the denomination the last 32 years, or wait a minute, 47 years of her life um, because of the misuse of funding. She then said to me, she said, well, Pastor Bill, clearly from your answers, from the spirit that you manifest in this phone call, let alone from the meetings we have seen you on YouTube presenting, 
She said, clearly the Lord is leading in your ministry and in your life. But she said, we can't have you on the program. And I said, ma'am, I said, I'm not looking for speaking appointments. And I really don't care if I'm ever on your program or not. It's no big deal to me. <laughs> Now, why do I share that story with you? This woman has watched programs of ours on YouTube, and I'm sure not just mine. She has, she and the person in charge of that global prayer line, they know that the messages we are giving are true and are God's messages for this time. She knows that. But folk, the reason she couldn't have me on that line was because the church is more important than the truth. Cody? <laughs> Folk, we all are coming to a, a crisis moment in the history of the truth of God and God's movement in this earth. And the question that ultimately each one of us will decide is, are we here to save and to defend the truth of God as it is in the three angels' messages or are we here to save the church? Now that's the issue that we will all ultimately have to decide. Will I save Jesus and the truth? Will I stand for Christ and the truth? Or will I seek to save the Seventh-day Adventist denomination? Because, folk, it, it was fascinating to me as I listened to this woman talk. It was almost as if she couldn't get it out fast enough. She said... Pastor Hughes, it's, it's so clear from your messages and from this phone call, I can see that the Lord is leading you and is blessing you. But I can't have you on. I thought, <laughs> you know, folk, as we get started this morning, I want to read. We're repeating history. We're repeating history. Let me read this passage, and then Paul has something. Just before Jesus was to be killed, John 11, it says this, starting with verse 47. It was right after Lazarus was raised from the dead. It says, Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? What are we going to do? This man doeth many miracles. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. They were saying, if we let Jesus go on, the church structure that we love, it's going to fall apart. And one of them named Caiaphas, the high priest that same year, said to them, you, don't, you know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people that the whole nation perish not. Folk, the same issue that is confronting Adventism today confronted ancient Adventism. And Caiaphas, as the general conference president, said, 
we must kill the truth in order to save the church. It's coming, folks. It's coming. Paul? As report, same thing, as report. I was going to say, that woman, in my estimation, was the epitome of hypocrisy. Okay. <laughs> Walter Ray, plagiarist, part two. You say, wait a minute. I thought Walter Ray accused Ellen White of be being a plagiarist. Yeah, he did. But Walter Ray got the idea that Ellen White was a plagiarist. He got it from somebody else. He stole it from D.M. Canwright. Both Ronald Numbers, as we noticed last week, and Walter Ray came out with books to try and destroy the writings of Ellen White. Now, as we noticed in that story from Edward this morning, see, outside of the United States, conference officials, Adventist conference officials, they're, they're bold folks, as you noticed in Edward's story. That pastor, that conference pastor, said to Edward, will you follow what Ellen White says or will you follow the conference? See, he's bold. He's, he's saying, you make your choice. Well, Ronald Numbers in the mid-1970s came out with a book about Ellen White and health and said she, got, she copied everything she said from health reformers in her day. That's what he said. And we showed last Sabbath that Ellen White repeatedly stated things about uh, the importance of exercise, the importance of diet and, and lifestyle, the importance of having your windows opened at night, the connection between flesh eating and cancer, uh, the importance of prenatal influences on a child's life. All of those things, just to name a few, were so foreign to the health concepts of the 19th century. So where did Ellen White get those things? Where did she get those things? She clearly got them from heaven. So Ronald Numbers, Walter Ray, who came out with a book called The White Lie in the early 1980s, both sought to destroy the ministry of Ellen White. Their lies were promoted by L.A. Times writer John Dart in October of 1981. Actually, that should be October of 1980. should be 1980. And eventually, his article spread all over the world. It, it started in the L.A. Times. It went to the Washington Post. And then other news, news agencies picked it up and spread it all over the world. If God's people would not spread the books of Ellen White like the leaves of autumn, then the Lord would allow unkind things and lies to be said about his penmen in order to agitate drowsy minds. Now, folk... <laughs> Herein is our job right here. Hook, line, and sinker. Spreading the books of Ellen White like leaves of autumn. Amen. There's our work right there. And nothing else is to get in the way of that. Next slide. Well, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, after the article in the LA Times and in the Washington Post, they hired a man a Catholic attorney by the name of Vincent Ramick. And Vincent Ramick was asked to research very thoroughly the writings of Ellen White to find if what she wrote was well within the law and that she had absolutely done nothing wrong in her writing. Well, now Vincent Ramick was a Washington, D.C. attorney in the 1980s, maybe he's still there, I don't know, probably not. But Vincent Ramick, a Catholic, 
His primary focuses were trademark, literary borrowing, um, plagiarism. These were the focuses of the law offices where Vincent Ramick was an attorney. Vincent Ramick read through many of Ellen White's writings and he declared that her writings had been a great blessing to him and that Ellen White had done absolutely nothing wrong. Nothing wrong in the borrowing that she did from other people's works. Vincent Ramick wrote, Mrs. White's sternest critics offer the best evidence available supportive of non-infringement. The 88 different authors, 400 references that are referred to in the great controversy, it suggested strongly that such utilization by Mrs. White of this vast reference material evidences skill and use of common materials and common sources of knowledge. Not merely colorable alterations and variations only to disguise the use thereof. It's inconceivable that even if Ellen White used 88 different authors and 400 references in the great controversy, she could have taken the value of any one of the original works to the degree that it be sensibly diminished or the labors of the original author substantially to an injurious extent appropriated by her usages. What was Vincent Ramick saying there? He was saying in what Ellen White borrowed from other authors in the writing of the great controversy, did not in any way, shape, or form diminish from the original book from which she got some material. And it did not hurt any author from whom she borrowed information. What in the great controversy or any other book of Ellen White's when taken as a whole is substantially a copy of the works of earlier authors? None. None. I'm going to show you a slide in a little while to show you about 15 of Ellen White's books and to show you how much of the material was actually borrowed from other sources. When a comparison is equitably made on a one-on-one -on -one book, verse-by-verse -verse basis, and such is the only comparison that can be properly made in law, nowhere have we found the books of Ellen White to be virtually the same plan and character throughout as those of her predecessors. Folk, did Ellen White get material from other people? Absolutely she did. Absolutely she did. And that was well within the law and well within the confines of the work she had as a messenger of God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cody? Here's the, here it is right here. Acts of the Apostles. How much of that material did Ellen White get from Coney Baron Housen's book on the epistles of the life of Paul? 3%. 3%. Are we going to take the beautiful literary work of Acts of the Apostles and say, well, I'm not going to read that book anymore because 3% of the book, Ellen White got material from Coney Barinhausen or some other author. Are we going to throw it out, folk? That's what Walter Ray was ready to do. And he did. And he did. Adventist tome. Not even 1%. 
Not even 1%. Child guidance, not even 1%. Christ object lessons, Christian service, not even 1%. Councils on diet and foods, not even 1% of the book. Early writings, not even 1%. Book education, evangelism, faith and works. Okay, faith and works, there's 2%, almost 3%. Are we going to throw out that beautiful book that shows the relationship of dependence upon Jesus Christ to enable us to do works of righteousness? Are we going to throw it out because she got some material from... Um, Maybe Hannah's book or Harris's book on the great teacher. Are we going to throw it away, folk? That's what Walter Ray did. And we're going to see a slide soon to show that Walter Ray didn't stop there. Because when you start doubting the spirit of prophecy, you ultimately doubt what else? The Bible itself. The Bible itself. Are we going to take that step? Walter Ray did. And I believe it cost him his eternal life. Next slide. Walt, uh, Vincent Ramick went on. Nor have we found or have critics made reference to any intentions of Ellen White to supersede the others in the market with the same class of readers and purchasers by introducing no considerable new matter or little or nothing new except colorful deviations. It was not Ellen White's intention by borrowing from Coney Bear and Housen's book on the life of Paul or on Hannah's book on the life of Christ or Harris's book on the great teacher wasn't her intention to say, I'm going to make the desire of ages and it's going to be better than theirs and we're going to sell more copies than them. It wasn't her intention at all. Ellen White wanted to give to the world the most beautiful book ever written on the life of Christ. And so she would take different sentences from other authors and incorporate them into her book with the intention of leading people to Jesus Christ. That was her intent. Vincent Ramick said, the sheer compilation of the works of Ellen White reflects her labor and skill. Now remember who's saying this, folk. This is a Roman Catholic lawyer. So long as she had not, and the evidence clearly establishes that she did not draw from any prior works to a substantial degree, she remains well within the legal bounds of fair use. So long as the materials were selected from a variety of sources, were arranged and combined with certain chosen passages of the text of the original work and in a manner showing the exercise of discretion, skill, learning, experience, and judgment, the use was fair. So... Whose idea are we going to take? Walter Ray and Ronald Numbers, who said, oh, she was a plagiarist. She, she deserved to be legally reprimanded and taken to law. Are we going to take that position, folk? Because maybe we don't like something that she says? Or are we going to look at this objectively and say, Wow, her writings have been such a blessing to my life. They have showed me our, my desperate need for Jesus. 
and for his power in my life. There's no way I'm going to touch her writings and throw them out. Next slide. Diller, Ramick, and White. Patent and trademark causes. And here is their address. They went on. All of the books listed earlier herein, which were published and uncopyrighted, which may have been used as sources by Mrs. White, could not give rise then or now to any proper or responsible accusation, copying, piracy, or plagiarism. Ellen White was not a plagiarist. She was not involved in literary piracy, nor was she copying from others. She simply was taking material that was available in her time and lacking an extensive education, only went through three grades of school because of illness. The Lord directed her to material that would paint the most beautiful picture of truth to lead people to Christ and the three angels' messages. And Walter Ray and Ron Numbers would say, oh, she's a plagiarist. And a Roman Catholic attorney would say, no, she wasn't. These books included, for example, The Life of Christ by Hannah, The Great Teacher by Harris, Sketches from the Life of Paul by Coney Barenhausen, and the remainder of the uncopyrighted works earlier listed here and under the caption, Library of Congress. The issue of copyright infringement is whether the book of the defendant taken as a whole is substantially a copy of the plaintiff. No critics have in any of the comparisons set forth earlier herein alleged, or nor could they have equitably alleged that any book of Ellen White's taken as a whole is legally substantially a copy of her predecessors. Case closed. Case closed. So Vincent Ramick is asked about this woman. What did you find in her messages, Mr. Ramick? How did they affect you? A Catholic attorney. Mrs. White moved me. In all candor, she moved me. I'm a Roman Catholic. I think her writing should move anyone unless he is permanently biased and is unswayable. Would you explain what you mean? Well, a person can walk this earth doing good and saying to himself, I'm a nice person. And after a time, you come to believe that you are. But when was the last time you really looked inside yourself and found out what you're really like? There are a lot of things that Mrs. White has put down on paper that will, if read seriously, perhaps cause a person to look inwardly, honestly. And if you do, the true self comes out. I think I know a little more today about the real Vince Ramick than I did before I started reading the message of Ellen White. Were you surprised at this reaction? I guess pleasantly surprised would be a very mild understatement. Quite honestly, I think I've left this task with more than I've put into it. And it's simply her messages. It's simply what you receive from reading something. 
he finishes off and he says, and for that, I think I'm a better person today than when I started this project. Amen. Now therein is an honest man. It's fascinating to me because the man, the man who was responsible for finding out how much Ellen White borrowed in her writing of The Desire of Ages. He was one of my professors at PUC. His name was Fred Veltman. And Dr. Veltman, in attempting to do this research, he came out in one meeting and shared his true sentiments when he said, you know, my wife does not like child guidance. My wife does not like Adventist home because they set a standard that she has said, I can never reach. And friend, that's a misunderstanding of Ellen White's ministry. Ellen White is not setting a standard for us to, to go after. She's setting a standard where we will look to Christ to reach that standard. Vincent Ramick, an honest Roman Catholic, I was moved. I was moved and am a better man after reading her writing. The best evidence of the intention of Mrs. White rests in what has been characterized as the central theme of her writings. God's original purpose for the world, the great controversy, and the work of redemption. One certainly perceives from her writings that she was motivated by the influence of the Holy Ghost. Wow. Roman Catholic. You can't but read what Ellen White said and not realize that her books are supernatural. Which itself belies wrongful intent and in proceeding with but the highest of motivations and intentions. She in fact legally modified, exalted, and improved much which others may have thought and expressed. It's impossible to imagine that the intention of Ellen White was anything other than a sincerely motivated and unselfish effort to place the understandings of Bible truth in a coherent form for all to see and comprehend. Most certainly the nature and content of her writings had but one hope and intent, the furthering of mankind's understanding of the word of God. Case closed. So if we take the spirit of prophecy as Walter Ray and Ronald Numbers did and many other Adventists and we say, well, she borrowed, therefore, we've got to just throw out the books. Are we going to use that same barometer with the Bible as well? Walter Ray did. The amount of borrowing is not the most important question. An instructive parallel is found in the relationship of the Gospels. More than 90% of the Gospel of Mark is paralleled in Matthew and Luke. One or more of those gospel writers borrowed from the other. <laughs> There's no two ways about it. So now if we don't like something in the gospel of Luke, are we going to say, well, that was borrowed too and throw it away? Contemporary critical Bible scholars are coming more and more to the conclusion that although Matthew, Mark, and Luke used common material, each was a distinct 
author in his own right. Thus, even higher critics have a more analytical approach to the study of literary sources than does the book by Walter Ray, The White Lie. At www.ellenwhite.info, an individual had occasion to speak with Walter Ray, who came out with the white lie in around 1981 or 82. This gentleman spoke with Walter Ray in January of 2000. So within a 20 year time of the coming out of his book. In our conversation, we asked him if the weapons used against Ellen White could also be used to discredit Bible writers. Indeed, liberal theologians accuse Bible writers of plagiarism. The same type of accusation Ray leveled at Ellen White. Ray responded to our question by saying that he, from his research of people copying and borrowing, does not take the Bible literally. Does not believe in a worldwide flood does not believe that God told Abraham to offer up Isaac and does not believe God told the Israelites to slay the Canaanites. Let's see now. I'm going to question the spirit of prophecy because I think she borrowed material. And therefore, I'm also going to question the Bible do we want to take those steps? That's scary, folks. You throw out the spirit of prophecy, the Bible eventually goes, and where are you standing? Friends, you are in quicksand, and you are rapidly sinking. Paul? Paul? Great, great point, Paul. Paul's point for the camera is the book of Revelation, John got almost exclusively from material in the Old Testament. John borrowed it from the Old Testament to write the book of Revelation. Are we going to throw it out too? Great point. Next slide. Walter Ray had trouble with how Ellen White wrote her books. A lawyer, Vincent Ramick, whose expertise was copyright and trademark, said Ellen White was well within the framework of fair use and had done nothing wrong. From there, Ray proceeded to throw out large portions of the Bible too. Are we surprised? No. No. You question the spirit of prophecy. You question the Holy Spirit that inspired those. You ultimately will question the Bible as well. The same spirit that inspired Ellen White inspired the Bible writers. It's only reasonable to throw out both if you care to tamper with them. And just as this man did, he decided he would throw out the baby and the bathwater. The Holy Spirit that inspired the Bible in Ellen White is rejected in the spirit of prophecy and eventually leads to rejection of the Bible as well. Jehoshaphat, in going against the Ammonites and other enemies of God's people in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, laid it out for us. He said, Hear me, O Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. Folk, this is Hebrew poetry. Believing in the Lord, that's one phrase. You'd be established. Believing his prophets is the same as believing in the Lord your God. If we are not 
listening to the voice of the prophet, whose face are we slapping? We're slapping the Lord's face. If, if our spirit of prophecy books, folk, if all our spirit of prophecy books are designed to do is to sit on a shelf at our house, what are we saying to the Lord? We're, if the Lord were in our house, we'd put him on a shelf too. That's what we do, folks. Because believing in the Lord is the same as believing his prophets. And if we are rejecting the prophet's voice, folk, we can stand in our head and bark at the moon. We are denying the God of heaven. Next slide. Ellen White used what other people said only so that the message would be clearer than what she may have said. In her human frailty, she recognized weakness in doing the colossal task the Lord requested of her. Amazingly, as Ellen White borrowed from other writers some material, she always knew what to borrow and what not to borrow. Isn't that interesting? Why was it that because predominantly in the 19th century, Christian writers were going to church on what day of the week? Sunday. Did they know anything about the sanctuary in Daniel chapter 8? No. And a host of other subjects. Health. health. Absolutely, Cody. Absolutely, Cody. Ellen White knew what to take, what would enhance the message, and what to shun because it was error. Now, how did she know that, folks? The Spirit of God gave her that discernment, Ron. Absolutely. The Lord revealed to her what was truth and what was error. Her intent was always and only that the truth of God would go around the world. It was never her intention to one-up another writer. The Lord needs them. Remember the story in Matthew 21, 1 to 3? The Bible says, When they drew nigh to Jerusalem, were come to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples. He said to them, Go to the village over against you. Straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them. Bring them to me. And if any man say aught to you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. So why did Ellen White borrow material to paint this beautiful picture of Bible truth in the face of Christ? and within the scope of the three angels' messages. Why did she do that? Because she wanted the best and most beautiful picture to be given to every child of humanity. And just as Christ said, so could Ellen White say as she was writing out the messages in her voluminous books, the Lord hath need of them. Case closed. Next slide. Ellen White said just that. If some writer said something in a clear-cut, comprehensive manner, she would use their words to express the thought and would not specifically give them credit. In other words, when she felt someone else said it better than she could, she'd use their words. Many accuse her of plagiarism or stealing other people's words. She was an avid reader. 
She borrowed from many writers. But how did she know what to borrow and what to leave out? What was truth? What was not? Next slide. You know, a few famous people, Cormac McCarthy once said, the ugly fact is books are made out of books. He's known to quote liberally from other books such as the Bible, Moby Dick, Milton, and even to take whole paragraphs and pages from 19th century books of history. He stole the villain of Blood Meridian nearly word for word from Samuel Chamberlain's My Confessions. William Shakespeare may have been the most successful copier. His style was heavily influenced by Ovid, the first century Roman poet. He also borrowed significantly for plots in his plays. He copied from history, from ancient Roman playwrights. There was even a book written 30 years before Romeo and Juliet called The Tragical History of Romeo and Juliet. Three rules for copiers, writers steal, borrow, and copy. It may be ugly, as Cormac said, but it's true. No masterpiece is completely original. As you find your voice, feel free to steal and imitate from other writers. Now, we're not encouraging people to steal, as Cormac said, but that's the mindset of this author. Originality is virtually impossible. It's impossible. Cormac wrote, he said, there's three rules to follow. Copy from one, it's plagiarism. Copy from two, it's research. Oh, John Milton said that, I'm sorry. Next slide. In closing, there's two slides. John Harris wrote a book in 1836 it's called The Great Teacher. And Ellen White borrowed material from this book. It was in her library. John Harris wrote this. He said, suppose, for example, an inspired prophet were now to appear in the church to add a supplement to the canonical books, meaning the books of the Bible. What a babel of opinions would he find existing on almost every theological subject. How highly probable it is. Now listen to what he said. How highly probable it is that his ministry would consist or seem to consist in the mere selection and ratification of such of these opinions as accorded with the mind of God. Capital G there. Absolute originality would seem to be impossible. The inventive mind of man has already bodied forth speculative opinions in almost every conceivable form forestalling and robbing the future of its fair proportion of novelties and leaving it little more even to a divine messenger than the office of taking some of these opinions and impressing them with the seal of heaven. That's what Harris said. If a prophet came in the 19th century, Every conceivable opinion is already out there, folk, on every biblical subject imaginable. And Harris said all it would take would be for that messenger, that prophet, to take the beauty of what is there, put them into books, and stamp it with the seal of God. Harris's quote is fascinating. A modern prophet would see viewpoints on all Bible subjects. Originality would be impossible. But heaven would know and would impress a prophet with what was right and true. The office of taking some of these opinions and impressing them with the seal of heaven 
In some ways, friend, that's exactly what Ellen White did. By the Spirit of God leading her, she was able to discern what was true and beautiful and what was wrong. And those things were discarded. I just pray, I just pray that we will stick with and promote and push the spirit of prophecy that people could understand the beauty of Scripture. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the writings of Ellen White. Thank you that they were to lead us to the greater light of your word, to see the beauty of scripture. We thank you for that gift and we just pray that you would light a fire in our hearts to share those books as far and wide as we can. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.